Hello and welcome to Tech Raven, the channel that brings you all things audio production, video production and photography. I'm Nigel Cooper and today I'm going to be talking about a music video that I recently filmed and produced for a local female singer. So during this video I'm going to be talking about the equipment used, some of the techniques, how we got from concept to completion and I'll be giving you a few handy hints and tips along the way and then at the end I will show you the music video in all its glory. So if you're in the market for shooting a music video on a mirrorless camera like I did or a DSLR or in fact any camcorder, stick around and hopefully you will learn something from my experiences. So basically when this artist first came to me and asked me about doing this song the only backing track available was a rather questionable quality mp3 file that had been downloaded off the internet and frankly it just didn't sound that good and um, this song it's a Chinese song but that doesn't make any difference it's basically done in a kind of western way with modern instruments uh, but it was sung in Chinese but I felt some of the instruments in it sounded just a little bit too oriental so there was some kind of harp like a small harp that sounded very plucky and what I can only assume was maybe like a bamboo uh, recorder or something like that so some of the instruments just didn't sound that good so the first thing I wanted to do was lay down a whole new backing track now not blowing my own trumpet but I do have a degree in classical piano performance I play the drums as you can see here from this Roland as well as the bass and the synthesizer so doing this wasn't a problem though it was a little bit time consuming so I had to replace the plucky harp with me playing the piano on a Roland digital piano to lay down the piano part I laid down the drums using the Roland and the bass using my Yamaha bass guitar and then I put in some strings using my Arturia MIDI keyboard controller and I laid down the part for a wooden recorder that sounded a bit more mellow and a bit nicer than the original one I laid that down using the synthesizer with a sample so that took me a few days but then I ended up with a really nice arrangement that sounded more westernized but it still had the oriental feel because it's in a pentatonic scale so it was always going to have that sort of Chinese feel anyway if you don't know what a pentatonic scale is it's basically the black notes on the piano so you've got F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, C sharp and D sharp just the five notes it doesn't have to be those five notes but you can start it anywhere but the intervals have to be that but that's another video which we won't get into because it's not relevant this is basically about shooting a music video so the singer then came to my house my small recording studio to lay down the vocal tracks over the top of that and this was done over two days about 90 minutes on each day and we did about 30 complete takes out of which there were three that I could cherry pick off there that were pretty good that I made just one comp from and even with that comp I then had to run it through Melodyne to adjust the timing and the pitch and some of the formats to kind of squeeze it and tighten it up a little bit so with that I then mastered that out of Logic after doing the mix and mastering myself from Logic Pro and dropped that onto the timeline in DaVinci Resolve ready for the video so with regard to the equipment I shot this on it was all filmed on a Sony a7 III and the only lens that was used was a Sigma 24 to 70 f 2.8 art series lens I had a battery grip on the Sony with two batteries in it because that allows me to shoot for all day basically I can shoot for like four or five hours on that uh, because the Sony just seems to be really good for battery um, power and how long you can shoot for and on top of that I had a little five inch screen on top of the camera one of the free, uh, free world ones I think it is I'll put a link in the description below they're only about £100 but it just makes composing the shots so much easier than trying to use the terrible little screens that are on the back of some of these mirrorless cameras because we all know that they're pretty useless so you have to put a bigger screen on top of the camera and this one comes with the, the lens um, hood for the sun and the HDMI cables and the bracket to attach it to the hot shoe so it's a, just a really nice accessory to have um, the tripod was a Liebeck THX again I've done a review on that I'll put a link in the description below it's about £250 and one of the best tripods for mirrorless and DSLR cameras for video because it's got a really nice head on it but I'll put a link in the description below for that as well the whole thing was shot using the picture profile 10 in the Sony a7 III which is not like S-Log I'm not a fan of S-Log because it's too much of a pain to grade and also you've got to be careful at exposing it you've got to over expose it a couple of stops and you've got to watch the shadows otherwise you can get a lot of noise in the shadows it's impossible to get rid of but I'm not a fan of it so using picture profile 10 it's got a really nice log system that's kind of like halfway between not using S-Log and using it so the picture is a little bit flat 
and um, the colors are a little bit desaturated but straight out of camera it still looks nice and you can still use it but all you've really got to do is add a little bit of an S curve just to give it a trifle of contrast and just pull back some of those colors by just boosting the saturation a little bit so it's nice and easy to grade but the good thing is you still get all that lovely dynamic range and you get smooth, nice roll-offs in the highlights as well. So that's why I used the Picture Profile 10. The whole thing was filmed in 1920 by 1080 at 25 frames per second. So I didn't use 4K. Um, I'm not a fan of it. I don't use it. For me, the difference between 2K and 4K, you just can't see it. On an iMac, on an iPad or an iPhone, it's just you can't see it. And even on my Samsung 55-inch screen, I've done tests between the 4K and the 2K out of the Sony and it's just so negligible it's not even worth bothering with so I can't see the point in using up all that extra storage space you need a lot more not to mention um, all the extra strain you're putting on the computer you know my fans kick in when I'm editing 4K everything's more sluggish I can't see the point in that when you just really can't see the difference between 2K and 4K anyway and I know a few YouTubers high-end YouTubers that got millions of subscribers that are shooting on very expensive kit with nice studios even they've gone back to shooting in 1920 by 1080 because they think well what's the point in 4k there's like hardly anything in it now that's a different argument and there's a lot of arguments on the internet about it but for me personally 1920 by 1080 at 25p is what i was shooting at now i wanted to do some slow motion so i actually shot several shots at 50p so i could slow them down to 25 in davinci resolve now the Sony camera does have an S and Q mode on it, uh, on the dial on top, which I don't use because the quality isn't very good. When you go into slow motion, the slower you dial it in, the lower the bit rate becomes. So it automatically lowers the bit rate, which destroys the image quality. So I can't see the point in using it when you can just change the shutter speed in the camera settings anyway. For me, that's just a better way of doing it. Okay, getting from concept to completion. When this artist came to me, she said she didn't really have any idea as to what to do so with it being sung in Chinese the first thing I asked her to do was send me over a lyric sheet that had been translated into English so I could get a feel for what the song is about that would help me come up with other ideas and to storyboard it. Now this song is kind of a romantic melancholy ballad about a lady who's lost her lover and she's all upset and she's singing about how the clouds are all full of rain and grey and the wind is blowing and the rain is coming down and so on and so forth. So I thought this video smacks of outdoor locations and in Cambridge where I live there's several really nice locations that I immediately thought of. I wanted the singer to be walking over a bridge, walking alongside a river or a pond, sitting in a poppy field, that kind of thing. Some of it mimed, so I took a ghetto blaster on location so she could sing along to it, and some of it just shot in slow motion with her doing other bits and pieces as well. So um, I originally wanted to shoot this entire video at double speed, so in Logic I had actually mastered out a version of the song at twice the speed but at the same pitch. Now this is a really clever technique, you've probably heard of it. The first time I ever saw it was with a song by The Police called Wrapped Around Your Finger, or is it Wrapped Around My Finger? I know the lyrics change throughout the song. Uh, but Sting is basically walking around or dancing around between all these candles on candlestick holders in the cathedral. Um, and he's moving in slow motion, but his lips are in perfect sync with the song. And the way they achieved that was by getting the singer to dance around and sing at double the speed to a song that they'd mastered out at double the speed, and then in post, when they slow it down to half speed, the lips are in sync, but everything else is moving in slow motion. So it gives a really beautiful grace to the shot. Now I did this, and I did a test shoot with the singer, and she could do it just fine, but afterwards she said she just felt uncomfortable doing it, like it was fake, and she was adamant that she didn't want to do that at all. So I didn't push it, I left it, but ironically, when I showed her the final video, the shots that she liked the most were the slow motion ones. So it's kind of like, listen to the director. So um, the moral of this story is, if you've got a creative idea, remember you're the director and the client or the singer or the artist, the band, they don't know how this process works. They don't know at all. And if you start explaining it, they'll get confused and they won't want to do things, they'll want to change things. So it's best not to say anything and to just do it anyway. And then they can, you know, you can wear them with the final result. Now, I've got a perfect example of this, a little story from yesteryear. There's a record producer called Butch Vig, who was a guitarist in a band called Garbage back in the day. But more importantly, before that, he produced Nirvana's world famous Nevermind album. Now, when he was doing that recording, he told Kurt Cobain that he wanted to do some vocal doubling, which is a simple audio uh, technique um, in, in the audio recording world 
where you get the singer to record the vocals twice, you do two takes of it, and then you take both the vocal tracks and you line them up one on top of the other and you slice up all the waveform, or in these days you'd probably do it in Melodyne, it'd be a lot easier, but right then they would have sliced up the waveform and lined up every syllable of every word, so it didn't really sound like two people singing, but it just thickens up the vocals and it just gives it an extra je ne sais quoi that you wouldn't otherwise get. Now when Butch Vig tried to explain this to Kurt Cobain, Kurt was like, no, I don't want to do that, my vocals are good enough, it'll ruin everything, I definitely don't want to do it. Now Butch knew that this was a really good technique, so he's going to push it through anyway. So what he did, he actually conned Kurt Cobain, he basically did a take, and then after the take he said, oh, yeah, I'm really sorry Kurt, I had the levels wrong, can we do that again? And he did it again, and then after the next one said, oh, I'm really sorry, I, I didn't have the gate set right, or the compression, he made up some other excuse, and he got him to do it again. And he made excuses about four or five times to get four or five takes. And then he used a couple of takes to do a vocal uh, doubling effect. And when he played the final result to Kurt Cobain, Kurt was like, oh, that sounds amazing, my vocals sound really good, what did you do? And she's like, well, vocal doubling. And Kurt's like, okay, that sounds great, I, I give in, let's do the whole album like that. So again, the moral of the story is, you're the director, you know how the process works, push through your ideas, and don't let the band or artist start chucking their ideas in because too many chefs spoil the broth and it will just end up being rubbish. Yes, they might have some good ideas, the artist. Take on board what you think is good, but discard what you don't and stick with your thing. There's a reason there's only ever one director on set and it's, it's a very good reason because you can't have more than one people chucking all their ideas into things, otherwise it just doesn't work. Okay, when I was doing the shoot on location, I didn't take any audio equipment apart from a small ghetto blaster because I didn't need any audio because I'd already mastered off my track from Logic Pro and dropped it onto the timeline in DaVinci Resolve already. So I just took a ghetto blaster along. In the Sony a7 III, I did crank up the recording level so the built-in microphone would pick up the ghetto blaster that was basically sitting about 30 feet away in the grass, hidden out of shot. So I only needed audio to create a waveform. It didn't matter how poor quality this audio was because once I'd matched up the waveforms in, in DaVinci Resolve, I was then going to delete that audio track anyway, so it didn't matter. So that's all it was that I had on location. Now, when it came to the editing in DaVinci Resolve, I did quite a few effects to make it look more cinematic. And one of the things I wanted to do was create a lot of light leaks. Now, if you don't know what light leaks are, just YouTube light leaks in DaVinci Resolve or light leaks in Final Cut Pro or how to create light leaks in video and you'll see loads of examples. But in a nutshell, the term came from if you imagine taking a knife and stabbing a hole in the side of an old fashioned film camera and then taking a photograph, light would leak in through that gash and it would cause like a fogging or a glare or a ghosting on the negative, hence light leak. Now to do this in video, it's a very simple technique. Again, you can just YouTube how to create my own light leaking techniques at home and people will show you, but I just use a 70 mil lens set at 70 mil. You zoom um, out to 70 mil and you set the focus to infinity. And with the camera on the tripod, I basically use two things. I use a crystal ball and a small um, prism, a glass prism that I bought off Amazon for like 10 pounds. And then holding the crystal uh, ball about literally an inch in front of the camera lens so it's right out of focus you need a small pointed LED light source. Now a lot of people when they do light leak effects they make mistake of using big video lights which is wrong. You need a tiny pointed source. So I use the LED light built into my iPhone 10 and while recording the video at night time in the dark I'd set the exposure for the light that I was going to be creating. I would slowly turn the ball around and while turning it moving the LED up the side of the crystals in the ball so it causes all these shimmering flickering effects coming across the frame. And while I was doing this, I did have my backing track playing in the background, not so I could try and sync it up, but just to get a feel, you know, get that vibe as to the feel of the song with the speed that I was going to be creating these light leaks with. And the prism I had was a long prism, about that long, triangular and about that thick. I held that in front of the lens while just moving my LED light up and down it to create these sort of squared off rainbow type effects. And then in DaVinci Resolve, I put that light leak clip above the clip that I want to affect and then I just screen blended it in, reduced the opacity of it by about 75%. Sometimes I would use the X and Y axis to move it around and feather the edges, um, maybe boost or change the colours, that kind of thing. You just treat it like any other clip to basically give the video more of a cinematic look. And given the nature of the song, this kind of ballad, uh, romantic, melancholy type thing, I figured having all these light flares and, and light leak effects coming in would be a really good thing. 
The other thing I did in DaVinci Resolve was a bit of skin softening uh, to soften the skin on the singer to make it look a bit softer and more romantic. I wanted it to have that kind of 1980s Crystal Carrington dynasty look. If you saw the sign, you'll remember that. Whereas whenever it would cut to her, suddenly on comes the soft down number two filter and then it cut to one of the male actors and the filter came off. So I wanted to give it that sort of soft romantic look. And on top of that, I put some cinematic bars. In DaVinci Resolve, it's really easy to do. You can just go to File and go down to Output Bars and select the output bars that you want, um, rather than having to use like ping files or anything on the actual timeline itself. Now, the output bars I used, I think it was um, 2.39, which is the Hollywood standard. And to confirm this, I did a little test clip, uploaded it to YouTube, and watched it on my TV, a 55-inch Samsung, and I put four bits of uh, masking tape on the screen where my output bars were and then I watched a load of Hollywood movie trailers on Prime Video so I could actually confirm this and about 90% of the American movie trailers I watched um, the bars lined up exactly where my masking tape was so that confirmed that I chose the right bar size because I wanted to kind of keep to that Hollywood standard. The few that weren't were slightly narrower bars but I basically like these bars it's what about 90% of the movies use so they can't be wrong and I just thought that gave it a more cinematic look it's just something that looks really nice and the good thing about using that you can actually move your image up and down because you've now got these bars at the top and the bottom so you can use the access to move up and down within the bars if you need to recompose the shot slightly so it's got another advantage there a couple of things that I did do which were mistakes which I wouldn't do again <clears throat> was I tried some handheld shots now on the Sony a7 III I made the mistake of thinking the built-in in-body image stabilization, the IBIS, was for video as well as photography, but it's not. It's just for stills photos. So the in-body stabilization in the Sony a7 III is not designed for video. It's designed for photography for when you're holding the camera really steady and you're going to take a shot and it's just there to nudge it and stop camera shake. That's what it's for. It's not there to replace a gimbal, not by any stretch. In fact, by turning that on for video, it just makes it worse because it fights as you're moving and it just jars all over the place and it's terrible. Even at 24 millimeters, when I was walking backwards with the singer walking towards me, the shots were just unusable. It's just too jerky. So if I was gonna do any handheld shots again, I would get some sort of gimbal to do it. Um, the other shots that I tried, which I wouldn't do again either, were zooming shots. Now. We all know that photographic lenses are not the same as dedicated video lenses. Back in the day when I would shoot on shoulder mounted cameras from the likes of Sony and Panasonic, I had a Sony SD cam full size rig for a while and the professional lenses on those have got zoom rocker controls which you can actually control the speed of and you can ramp into and out of it and you can make all sorts of settings and there's a lot of throw on the actual gearing of the lens for that as well whereas on a photographic stills lens you go from there to there and you've gone from like 70 to 200 without really doing much so you can't really do a zoom shot i tried a couple no matter how smooth and sly I was they were just jerky and didn't work and to be honest, even back in the day when I was shooting on professional broadcast cameras that did have the zoom rocker switch, I hardly ever used it anyway because I always felt that zoom shots are a bit amateurish, which is why you never see them in Hollywood movies, you don't see them in TV commercials, they're just, we've got grip equipment, you know, got tens of thousands of pounds worth of grip equipment or hundreds of pounds worth with uh, smaller DSLRs and mirrorless cameras. Uh, with this grip equipment, it allows you to move through the scene. You don't zoom into it. That always looks terrible. So I would never try zoom shots again, and I wouldn't do any handheld shots unless I basically bought a gimbal. So that's a couple of mistakes that I made that I wouldn't make again. Okay, so without further ado, I'm now going to play the video for you. It's about four and a half minutes long. You'll notice those cinematic bars. You'll notice the grading. It's a slightly softer look, and the skin toning, um, where I just sort of smooth the skin out a little bit. And also, for some of the shots, I did have the singer wear a black dress. It's more like a funeral dress because I've got this black theatrical mask. It's almost like something out of Amadeus or Farinelli. And I wanted her to wear that to almost give a bit of a subplot to the, to the video so that people watching thinking, oh, what's going on here? It just hints at that melancholy thing. And I suppose it could suggest that the partners died maybe. I don't know, but it's just something that I came up with and I thought it looked good and cinematic. So you've been watching Tech Raven. I'm Nigel Cooper. Check out my other videos and if you like what you see, do subscribe and give this video a thumbs up. So without further ado, here's a video in all its glory. Until the next time, stay cool. Bye for now.
有。